have been taking some advice on video composition and the top hint was do a short preview at the beginning. So in this video of a cargo wagon, a kit by Jonathan Hall, I'll be sawing a piece of wood, pretending to be in an episode of Thunderbirds and gluing cocktail sticks to a piece of paper. This isn't the sort of kit I'd normally take on, but I thought I might try and broaden my horizons, also trying to give a little bit back to some of my continental viewers. And for my friends in North America, I say that I've got another video coming up in the near future specifically for you. Like my last kit build, which was the MTK inspection saloon, this one also comes with a precast main body, albeit this one resin opposed as opposed to aluminium. This is also a new medium for me to work in. I can't remember ever doing a resin kit before. This one comes with a modest amount of detailing parts, but it will need some enhancements and we'll have to find some odd bits to add on. As you've seen, most of the kits that I buy come with minimal instructions. This one comes with none at all. The only paperwork that came with it was a not to scale drawing uh, and that was it. So I'm going to have to do lots of research online and scour the books that I have for any references. With this being a four wheel long wheel based wagon it's important that the chassis is flat and square which is something you hear me go on about even on short four wheeled wagons. Now there was a little bit of twist in the resin body which made up my mind to use a piece of 12mm plywood as the chassis base and that should ensure that the whole wagon stays rigid and flat. Now my concerns with long wheel based four wheel wagons isn't restricted to just models. On the real railway the same thing applies. As can be seen in these photos loaned to me by my friend Brian. Now these and other similar wagons are designed with a certain degree of flex in the chassis which is alright when they're loaded because the weight in them sort of pins the wheels to the rails. It's sort of the heavier load that's in them the more flex in the, sh in the chassis which means they will stay on more contorted track. But as soon as you take the weight out of them, there's nothing to hold them down and the flex in the chassis sort of disappears to a certain degree. And if they go over sort of uh, obscure, obtuse, no that's not the right word, um, adverse cambers, point work, rough track, it can sometimes bounce the wheel, bounce the wagon off the rails. From the outset, I knew that the coupling was going to be a very important part and getting it in the right position was essential from the word go. So I've opted again for this Simoba, if that's the right way to say it, articulated system. I've used it before, really good. I'll leave a link in the description from where I get them. There's a couple of outlets that are doing them these days. Folding up the sub chassis assembly from the etched parts supplied was next. This is obviously sped up but it only took me literally two minutes to fold these up. What took considerably longer was getting them in the right position on the underframe. It wasn't too much about the distance between them but aligning them so they were absolutely dead square was quite difficult. Being flat wasn't too much of an issue either because this is ingeniously set up with a compensated axle at one end. Accomplished by threading a short length of brass wire through the wheel set cradle and then onto the base plate. Brake blocks and brake rigging are also on the supplied etch and fit nicely onto the wheel set cradle as well. Like the last kit that I built, which was the MTK LMS inspection saloon, this kit doesn't come with 
that many detailing parts. So once I'd put all the brake rigging on and the brake cylinders, truss rodding and the like, the buffers and suspension units, I then spent what seemed like an absolute eternity putting odd little bits and pieces on, making them first. Steps, handrails, door locking mechanisms, messing about with Bits and pieces that are smaller than the grain of rice is sometimes a bit questionable. But once they're on, it they do really break up the slab-sided nature of this large, boxy wagon. It had rather defeated me at this stage, which is why from announcement when I was going to do this on my Facebook page to actually completing it took such a long time. I managed to do a plethora of other things in between just trying to not do this. I also managed to inadvertently lose some of all the footage of the initial paint stage as well which might have put a complete stop to the whole project but looking for some disk space I discovered it just recently which inspired me to finish this off so I could start something new. I wasn't quite sure whether there'd be a reaction between my preferred enamel paints and the resin body. So I took the safe option and went for water-based paints. Next was a coat of metallic silver, followed by masking up and then the rest of the superstructure picked out in a generic blue. I wasn't concerned about the colour so long as it was fairly similar because the weathering process would distort that colour beyond anything that it was supposed to be anyway. As I mentioned before, this wagon falls just outside my area of interest. The first cargo wagon prototype was developed in 1982 by a company called Dorg. Yeah, Dorg. The production batch of 146 followed between 1983 and 1985. All of them were initially hired to Ford and Volkswagen. The Ford vans replaced elderly BR pallet vans. When I was a driver at Crew, we used to tow the Ford vans quite regularly up to Halewood, Liverpool. And of course, these single vans shouldn't be confused with the later twin sets, which were semi-permanently coupled. The twin sets also had a different underbelly as well. It was like a fish belly, as opposed to this van's uh, angle iron trussing. With painting complete it was time to do some decoration with some decals. Railtech produced a sheet of transfers that complemented this kit excellently and if they hadn't have done it would have been well almost impossible to get the correct lettering. Warm water to soak them off of the backing paper and then humbral decal fix to get them to help them sit in the right place and then sealed in with some acrylic satin varnish. And then to complete, it was just painting the details, handrails and the ferry fixings, the eyes and hooks, and not forgetting the handbrake wheel. Like I said earlier, I wasn't too worried about the shades of blue and yellow and even the silver, because the weathering process was going to ab almost obliterate them beyond recognition anyway. Studying the photos online and in books and some of my own photos of these wagons, they appear to take on a sort of brown hue. And because I'm not particularly very good with colours, I matched up the paint pots that I had on in my stock against the photos and then just picked a light a medium and a darker shade of brown that sort of matched up with what was on the wagon. I ended up with a mixture of Humbrol and Revel paints. You can see the numbers on the screen. It was then a case of just taking a large deep breath and putting paint in the airbrush. This is what I call making it up as you go along. I can't remember whether I read it in a book or watched it on a video. But it said that the basic fundamentals of weathering is multiple layers. Dirt and grime in multiple layers. Thin, 
multiple layers building up the colour slowly. And when I mean thin, I mean that's the paint to thinners ratio. And I used 75% thinners, 25% paint. I started off with the lighter shade and it was just an all over coat. And then it toned down the blue considerably. I was going to try and fade it, but the lighter coat of the lighter shade of brown did that naturally. I did probably three coats of the lighter shade and then went in with the dark shade uh, trying to get under all of the canopies and in the corners and recesses. After every three or four coats of paint I then went in with a damp paintbrush and just wiped off some of the uh, paint from the numbering so that it was legible. It gives it the appearance of being washed off periodically. I could have done it with masking tape and taken it off right at the end, but I wanted the underneath to be stained. I did think I'd possibly made a mistake and could have done the first coat of weathering and then applied the decals, but as it turned out, I didn't need to do that because it turned out okay, as we'll see in a few minutes. Because I'm making this up as I go along, the next step should have been the first step, but it didn't really matter which order it, so long as it gets done. I made a panel line wash from cheap oil paints. Many modellers do this, and they all do it in the same way. It's a little bit of oil paint on a bit of cardboard that drains all the linseed oil out, and then you can scoop what's up left into a little pot, add some thinners, to the desired viscosity. Then with a nice fine paintbrush we can scoop a little bit up and then drop it into the corners, recesses of all the panels. I wasn't that concerned about the tide mark effect or the fact that it was quite harsh uh, because I've only put about four coats of uh, brown weathering on and there's about a dozen more to go on over the top of it so it should tone down nicely. With plenty of the wash still left, I then picked out the details on the running gear, making sure it drops into all the recesses to give that deep shadowy effect. The work we'd done with the airbrush so far had been from quite a distance to give an overall effect. Now it was time to get up close and personal, targeting specific areas individually. Watching this back, it does look quite horrific, but it wasn't as bad as it looks for some reason. Because it's quite difficult to tell with multiple layers what's going on, you can tell the difference here because I've done half of the wagon. Then it was back to washing off the numbers and as you can see there's quite a lot of staining on the body side which meant it wasn't completely silver. While I was waiting for the body side to dry off a little bit more ready for the next coat, I took the opportunity to wash off the handbrake wheel and the ferry fittings as well, just to make sure that they had a little bit of yellow showing through and weren't completely covered in cac. Before the paint dried completely, I wanted to address the end, and that was to wash them off, so to speak, with a brush that was laden with thinners and just keep stroking it downwards, introducing that streaking sort of effect that rainwater gives washing dirt and grime downwards. Making sure not to wash it out completely from all the corners and edges because that's where all the dirt and grime accumulates on the real thing as well. And then to blend it all back in again it was then time for probably one of the final coats of brown mix. And then it was back with a damp paintbrush, wiping off all the numbers again. With the paintbrush still in hand, I then went and addressed some other little bits and pieces that I thought need, needed doing, which was washing off the tops of the buffers, and then at, at the roof as well. I had to get quite a lot of thinners on the brush to do the blue part of the roof, but I was careful enough not to let anything drip onto any of the panels underneath it. I was sort of convinced that I got to the point where I thought enough was enough now. So I then waited for it all to dry off 
and then referenced it against the photo in the book. And I think it's all right. So to finish off, I think we're going to just add the wheels, which is quite an important part. Unmask the coupling swivel thing. The NEM pocket that we that you can see here is also part of the Simoba family of parts. Again, I'll leave a link in the description. And as I said earlier, because this is a long wheelbase wagon, the coupling needs to have some sort of articulation to it. Otherwise, it would just drag itself and other things off of the rails altogether. And the way that it's been designed makes it very easy to get it to the correct height. Because I haven't quite decided what I want to do with this van in the future, whether I want to sell it or give it away, I took it to the local model shop and put it on their test track, which is a series of back-to-back -back second and third radius curves. It trundled around for the best part of half an hour without incident. This project started out with good intentions and then I lost interest completely in the middle. Too many other things going on probably. But then the desire to start a new project prompted me to get this done. So with renewed enthusiasm I knuckled down and got the job finished. And I think we've made a pretty good job of this one. So there we have it. A resin kit by Jonathan Hall of a fairly modern continental long wheel based four wheeled van cargo wagon to be more precise well it's been nice talking to you again and i'd like to thank you for watching and i'll see you next time